Hey everybody, welcome back to the Live Ultralight Podcast powered by Outdoor Vitals. Today we are going to be breaking down not only mine, but Darren's ultra race that we just completed called the Tusher Mountain Ultras. I ran the 70K, even though it was a 75K, and Darren ran the 100K, even though it was something over that as well. 104. 104K. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about that, and we've got some stories to tell for sure. Um, we did a pre-race podcast on this, so if you want to go back and listen to that, you can kind of hear what we were thinking beforehand and what our training and our plans were. And then in this podcast, we'll be breaking down how those actually went on the trail. Before we jump in, though, I did just want to highlight a couple things. Um, this is August now. It's technically August 2nd when we're recording this, which means that the CS40 backpacks will be shipping and the Skyline fast packs are right around the corner. So stay tuned. Both me and Darren did use the Skyline fast packs on this race, and we've used them a ton for different uh, multi-night adventures as well. So if those are two things that you're looking for, those are two things that are coming very, very shortly. So, okay. Oh, I don't have no idea where to begin. I'm going to crack open a soda and we're just going <laughs> to hang out and, and we're going to just digest this. We've got Tyler in the studio as well to just help us navigate this. Cause I'm sure we could get down some rabbit holes and get nowhere. But um, I'm going to be the fact checker. The, yeah. fact, the fact checker. Make <laughs> yep. sure we're not telling too big a story over yeah. here. Um, I don't know where else to start other than I, I guess I won't I won't tell you how things ended. We'll try not to tell things <laughs> how things ended just yet. Um, I think both me and Darren were a little surprised at how things ended. It was it yeah. was different than plans, but that's what you'd expect in a ultra marathon that can go for. 15 to 24 hours. So, um, Darren, you, uh, you showed up the night before got registered. This is your first ever ultra. This is my second ultra, Mm -hmm. even though I've, I've only ever done this ultra. So it's just my second attempt at the same ultra twice. Um, I mean, you just, you slept in the back of the truck and, uh, took a Benadryl. I don't know if you went to sleep or not, but, uh, (laughs) I never saw you again. Okay. So, (laughs) To clear, yeah. So my whole goal was just to go up there in the truck and sleep in the back of it. Had a little inflatable pad, and uh, I got registered. It, that went fine. And then I was just sitting in my truck eating some sandwiches, and Taysom pulls up right behind me, and I was like, "Oh, I recognize that beard." Yeah, <laughs> you better. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like just there's so many people. But anyhow, Taysom's like, "Hey, you know." When you're done, or when he gets checked in, he's like, just follow me to the camp. And uh, I was like, ah, I don't want to interrupt, you know, their family time and whatnot. And I can just sleep here in the parking lot. But he was pretty insistent. And so after he got checked in. You would have slept like crap there, dude. People I, I would have going all night. The lights would have been, been on all night, yeah, too. So so we actually, after he got checked in, I followed him back to his camp. And it was this nice little um, meadow-type area, plenty of spots for me to give him his privacy, but still be able to, to kind of kick back and relax. And I think that was, what, seven at night mm-hmm. by the time that we actually got there. Sounds right. And that, and that was actually really good. I mean, it, it, I slept pretty good until it started raining on me. Oh, it started <laughs> raining? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then I just pulled the, the top quilt over my head and I was able to sleep. But I took a Benadryl and I was, I was out and I, I slept pretty good until – to about three in the morning, and I knew I was going to get up pretty quick after that, anyway. So. Yeah. So your uh, your start time was five a.m. Right. Yep. Mine was at five, K. and then his would start an hour after that. So at three, I just kind of stayed there and huddled up, thought about my day until four. That's when I got dressed and started. So no so nerves. You're awake from three a.m. Yeah. So oh was that gosh. nerves? You waking up that early? It's or it had to be. Yeah. I I, I, I mean I I, I just was thinking like well. That race is going to be starting pretty soon, and I don't want to sleep past an alarm. So I was like, within an hour, I'm going to get up anyway. So I stayed up. Did you eat anything? The, just the night before. So the night before, I had no s- like, turkey sandwiches and some meat sticks and things that I knew. He was that, drinking uh, Mountain Dew as he was going to bed. I'm like, dude. <laughs> That's well, normal for yeah, me. I have, a, I, have a, I have a pretty high caffeine tolerance. His desk so. by mine. You should see how many Mountain Dew cans are in there. <laughs> it's one can. a day, but, you know, it adds up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in that camp, that camp was fun. We had the year previous, I had run 
with some kind of extended cousins. And um, then my first cousins were there and, and an uncle were there watching us. And they were just telling me that I was stupid and crazy the whole time I felt like, and their eyes were always this big and they just couldn't believe that we were out there doing this. They live in Beaver, which is just down the Canyon from the ski resort. And, and they, um, they just thought we were crazy. But then all of a sudden, like two months after last year's race, they, I find out that they signed up for the race and I'm like, what in the world? I thought they hated the idea of this. Anyways. So we were in camp with them. So I had my uncle running and he was 51 years old running and then my younger cousin and then one of their cousins as well. And so we had kind of a fun camp. They're, you know, nervous, asking a bunch of questions. Um, and yeah, just, just, it was, it was a good time, but yeah. I was kind of same as you. I didn't fall asleep very well, but then once I did, I, I slept pretty good until I, I slept in as long as I could. So I slept until about five fifteen almost, and then just kind of scrambled to get to the start. So. Yeah. Yeah. I went to bed early, so I still got a full night rest. So, so how did the start go for you? Start was awesome. Um, a lot of people all excited, you know, like people taking their photos. Did you, like, did you feel like you were surrounded by some elite ultra runners? <laughs> you know, that's, it's really surprising because some people look like they're built for it. And then there's others like, man, you're a runner, you know, like yeah. they come in all shapes and sizes. They do. It's and, nuts. <laughs> I can't figure it out. And so I, I felt like, okay, I fit right in somewhere in the middle. So, yeah. and, uh, I was like, I, I tried not to think about the race a whole lot, like other than I'm just going to get into it. So I didn't psych myself out if that's what the question you, is, but do you have any idea like what your first couple of miles like pacing was? No, no, no. Yeah. I, I just stayed with the crowd. I couldn't go pa- faster. I couldn't go slower. So yeah. it's pretty tight in there depending on where you get in the crowd. Cause the, the first guys, man, they freaking, they take fly. Off. I mean, they take off, but the rest of us are kind of in a, in a pack, but yeah, for me starting out, um, my cousins and my uncle got separated because they couldn't park in yep. the right spots. And so me and my uncle stood around there looking at each other as the start. And then we started in the dead last of the pack. And honestly, I think that was a really good thing because we still put in like 15 minute miles the first like three miles. And I was like, I don't want to go any faster than this, you yeah. know, and because I know I'd, I'd just pay for it. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of an awkward start. We're like, well, yeah. well, they're saying go crap, we're, <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was good for, for me, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess in that first segment, did you have any milestones, goals, issues? For me? No. Um, there was one point where I got a little off trail and that's just because the flags, like there was probably 10 of us where we all kind of like. Where, they, where do we go? You know, like oh, my watch is going off saying you're off trail. I'm like, I think we got to go back that way. And we, we actually found our way back. And that was only, you know, maybe a two minute deviation. And it's like, that was the only hiccup. It was dark. Mm. And, uh, it, it wasn't just me. It was, it was a bunch of people. And so you ran a lot in the dark, my friend. We, we, we sure did. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone in that hundred class, like hundred K class, like they, they're not, I don't know. They, they know what it's like to run in the dark now. So, yeah. 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 For me, um, prior to starting out, we were allowed to drop two drop bags. There were some course deviations to the course. Um, so that, that kind of changed some of my planning last year. I was able to have my crew at three different aid stops. And this year I was only able to have them at one aid stop, um, due to snow levels and gates on the mountain. Um, and so it, it changed things. So I did two drop bags. And so I pre-packaged basically like a sandwich size Ziploc with um, a pre-mixed mixture of Scratch Labs, what used to be called Hyper Fuel. That's super like Fuel. Super, super carb now or, or Hyper Carb mm-hmm. or something is what it's called now. But it's like a 400 calorie with sodium um, drink mix. And then I mixed other another one of their like wellness scratches in there, which gives me... Well, so that, that alone was like over a thousand milligrams of sodium and then, um, you know, 500 carbs. And then I had snacks in each bag. And so I had my camel back loaded with one of those. And then my two, my two flasks were loaded up with, with fluid. And then I had some calories. My goal was basically to go through each aid station and mix up another one of those so that I was getting f- almost 500 liquid calories between every aid station and then I was eating also another potential 500 calories 
Um, having done this race before, I hit a massive wall at like mile 30 where I just lost all energy. Um, you know, I, I had my issues last year with, with running and knee pain and chin pain and all that kind of stuff that, that kept me from running fast paces, but almost more than anything else, it was probably calories and, and, um, salts and stuff that really screwed me up over salting and then messing up my gut. And so this year I was, I was, I spent so much of my, you know, training time on trying to dial that in. So I really tried to execute there. So I had two drop bags with my Ziplocs in there that had kind of my mixes ready and, and then some restock of, of fueling. And, and then on this particular carry, I had to carry one of those in my backpack because the resupply, there was no drop bag and you're at an aid station that's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I just, when I got there, I switched that out. So yeah, first aid station for me, um, getting there was pretty smooth. I felt pretty good. How many miles? Um, was it's that? eight. eight. eight and- yeah. Most of these are going to be close to eight or just under. So that one is, is pretty much exactly eight, um, with over 2000 feet of climbing and about 1600 feet of descent, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, about 22 and 17. So, um, still a lot of climbing, but not a lot of like massive climbs at one time. So it didn't, it doesn't feel like 2,200 feet of climbing, especially when you're fresh. Um, but yeah, went pretty well. I did go to jump over a Creek at like mile seven and my calf cramped just a little bit. And I was like, what the heck is going on here? Like I've run so many training runs, 15 to 20 mile training runs over and over with no cramping. Like so I just tried to like put it in the back of my mind, breathe deep, get my heart rate down and just think maybe it's stress, maybe it's something else. Um, but yeah, I got to that first um, aid station. And for me, I actually got in maybe a hair slower than last time. And I think, I don't think that was a bad thing. Like I, I kind of am doing some guesses with my watch data, but it looks like last year I got in there at like 203 and this year I got there in like 207. So maybe four minutes behind last year's pace, which um, to me was was right on. I was not trying to run this section any faster than I did the first time. And it makes sense for me starting in the very back and even waiting just a little bit um, for for cousin and, and whatnot. So yeah, a really common mistake is too fast, too soon, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. So I felt like that was right on pace. Essentially that puts me at, um, what, 15 minute miles roughly yeah, somewhere around there, which, you know, technically is, is too fast when you look at the entire day, but <laughs> it doesn't feel too fast when you're typically running 12 minute miles on 15 mile runs for training. Right. Yeah. So very stable pace, but, um, yeah, got to the aid station, um, cycled through my, my resupply stuff and headed out. I don't yeah. know if there was much else in that first section for you, Darren, that stood out or no, other than some of those 70 K guys, when they started, like they passed me and in the first section, the first, before you got to the first aid before station, before we got to the first aid station, there'd be people yelling on your left. And I saw their little, yep. Their yellow tags. That's where you guys yeah, had. Yeah. They were the 70 K guys and they were flying. And I, I was more of a middle of the pack kind of guy, like this whole race. But on this section, like they were going past everyone. They had to be the course. That's an the hour course. behind. Yeah. yeah. So they cut an hour. Because I bet you probably ran that first segment in an hour or two hours as well. Pretty similar pace yeah. to me. And, yeah. And so that means they cut an hour out of a two-hour segment. Wow. It's like getting it done right at the first when they're yeah, fresh. they're flying. Yeah, that's um, nuts. Very interesting. I mean, it's. They're not doing it wrong. <laughs> no, they're not. I mean, there's a reason why they're so fast. Right. Well, the the Dude. very fastest 70K guy he was record, eight hours, 42 minutes. Yeah, yeah. so it makes so, sense. Insanity. Kyle Curtin. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the course record. Um, but That's insane. Um, anyway, so start the next section. It's kind of a steep climb up through a pass, and then you – then we had a snow field and yeah. this was a gnarly <laughs> snow field. Um, I don't know what it was like for you. Like, did you end up sliding down it and I d- crashing? So I, I did. I mean, <laughs> but it was more of a slide at this point. You know, like we knew that we weren't going to get all the way down. Like there was. Oh, it stopped in the middle? Yeah. So like <laughs> there's some steps people were like trying and then their feet would come out from underneath them and they'd slide the rest of the way. And then there was a bunch of like. Uh, uh, what are they? Cedar trees or mm. pines at Later the bottom? Pines, pines. Yeah. and people would crash into those. But we were at least smart enough to 
let him get up and get out of the way before the next guy did it, you know? And so that, that happened, you know, like I get going and I thought maybe I could put my foot in a little bit harder. My feet came out from under me and I went down too. It's like, but mine came out pretty slow. I didn't run into any trees. I just slowed down the bottom and I kept going. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, that's, that's where it started with those, those ice, you know, fields. Mm-hmm. So by the time I got there, um, it's, it was a mess. I, I just like, if you know what lemons are, I think is what they're called. Lem- Lem- lemmings. 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 Um, yeah. that they, f- they'll follow each other off of cliffs. Right. That's exactly what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> like I come up and like, I hear some people yelling and I'm like, what the heck? You know? So I kind of get up there and I hear more yelling and then I cr- start crossing the snow field and I start seeing people slide down. I'm like, Oh wow, this looks crazy. And so I get up and I look off the edge kind of, and I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. You know, I'm watching people slide into other people. I'm watching people like waiting and then their feet come out from under them. And so then they slide down. I'm watching people crash into trees, like wrap themselves around trees. And I'm like, what's wrong with these people? So I just start walking up the snow field and I go up and around the whole thing. Like it was like maybe a 30 yard deviation, you know, but meanwhile, people are sliding down this thing. So I do my little wrap around. I get a couple, I probably got a, you know, I probably got a couple hundred yards behind like someone who just bombed through it, you know, and, and potentially hurt themselves. And I start running and this lady is a hundred K right behind yeah. me now. And she's like, oh, I don't feel good. And I'm like, what do you mean? What's wrong? You know? So I kind of stop and talk to her as she's walking and she's like, I hit a tree really hard on that glissade. And, and then we take a few more steps. She's like, something's moving. Like I've cracked my rib. Like it's just mm-hmm. floating in there. And I'm just like, what are you? <laughs> I just couldn't believe it, you know? And so then I like run a little farther. I meet this other guy. He had broken his leg and was oh. just walking out of there at this point. And I watched another guy like eat crap in a creek. And so like within like two or three miles, I watched like three people basically DNF their races. And I'm like, holy smokes. Like take a chill pill yeah. people like be smarter like i don't know what's going on but i felt really bad because that lady did not i mean she she hit hard and clearly you know snapped her rib and um so yeah don't don't follow people off of glissades for no reason <laughs> yeah well i don't think it counts as a glissade if you're out of control just flying down the mountain that's just a crash <laughs> that's, yeah it's just a crash yeah. pretty much <laughs> pretty much a controlled crash yeah <laughs> So this next section, um, start running down and man, this is one of those sections where I kind of forgot just, just like how far this section was. Um, so going past Delano, going, dropping down before the climb. Before, yeah. Like we, so this whole race, like this race starts at like 10,000 foot and change and at then the, at the resort, at the resort and then it just, it just climbs. And so like, we've already gone through like. 10,008 foot or maybe 11,000 foot passes. And then we drop all the way down and then we climb back up to a 12,200 foot peak. And, um, as I'm dropping down off this edge, I'm getting more crampy feeling already. And I'm just like, not the same cramps that I had last time. Cause it, it, literally right after the eight, the first aid station last time I was, I was like unable to run. I, my, my shin, my tibs were cramping so hard and, and so, and were just so painful that I couldn't run, um, as well as just other, I think I had some other cramping at that point in the race, but so I'm like feeling better than the year prior, but I'm still starting to get these little traces of cramping. So my strategy in that is to slow down, drink more. And, you know, I've got all of my mixes dialed as best as I can and, um, I just drink more, right? So hydrate and slow down, slow down my effort and see if, see what happens, lower my heart rate, maybe a little bit. And, um, yeah, I was, it was like, it was this, this section, two races in a row has been a very, very frustrating section for me because it's like the turning point in both races where it's like, why are things going wrong this early? Um, so yeah, I, I get, you know, ran all the way to the bottom of this dang thing and then turn to start climbing up. And then I'm just basically balancing, hiking at a speed where I'm not feeling like I'm going to cramp, but not like 
going as fast as I might could, which again, at this point, like I'm still definitely trying to pace myself. So, but it is a 3000 foot climb, right? Yeah. So this section is, there's like two pinnacles of the race. This one is not really considered the pinnacle because it's, I think it's cause it's so early in the race. Um, but this section, according to last year, it's a tw- basically 2,900 foot climb and a 2,900 foot descent in eight miles. So it's just straight up or straight down this entire section. Yeah. And you um, peak over 12,000 feet. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Yep. So it's, it's brutally steep everywhere you go on this section. And yeah, so, I mean, for me, at least I, I got through this section. Um, I did feel really good that on the other side of Delano, I was able to, um, run down. I don't, uh, I don't know that it, it like got me a ton of extra time or anything like that, but I was able to jog down, um, that steep side. And I was like, well, I couldn't do this last year. So that's yeah, last year you I was, had that injury and everyone was like, are you okay? I'm like Did stopped like on the side on the downhill. Yeah. yeah I was completely stopped, down. crouched down five or six times trying to like stretch out and fix my leg and people were stopping asking if I'd fallen and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. so that was different. And then I got to the bottom and I couldn't have crew at the aid station, but we could see crew like on the roads. And so I did see, um, my, my family, my kids, my wife, my parents were there. Um, you know, so I was able to see them for just a second on the road and then, and then keep going on. So, um, how, and- how did it make you feel to see them right then? It's, it's a very good motivational booster for sure. Um, so I like came into there feeling really good, really strong. Um, and then as soon as I left, I got up to like a steep part on the road and I cramped up and then it was like right back to the same spot of being like, gosh, dang, this is stupid. I'm like 15 miles in. And, and again, just to go backwards for just a second, for me, why this is so frustrating is one, it happened the year previous. So I trained for a year to try to overcome this kind of stuff with nutrition, hydration and training. So, I mean, through the summer from May till now, you know, till the race, essentially, I was doing at least one run a week where I was getting 15 to 20 miles in. And I was doing that with tons of vertical three to 4,000 feet of vertical up and down faster pace than this, you know, like everything was harder than this or trying to be harder than this in a more condensed time period. So to me, this is just like so frustrating. Right. And we'll, we'll talk more on that, but got to the aid station, went through it. My Snickers was melted in my drop bag, (laughs) but uh, other than that, it was good. That's a damper. Yeah. But Darren, how did this section go for you? So the section going past Delano, I was the same. I actually started cramping on the way up and I took uh, one of those straight to mouth STM packs and, uh, you know, it's electrolytes and that made things worse for me. <laughs> like, ah. I was just like, gosh, did you like, eat any breakfast? No, I never do that. <laughs> so okay. it's like, I don't oh, like to man. change. I don't like to change. You just, you just like to get a calorie deficit right out of the gate. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm a glutton for a punishment. So <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get- <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I start cramping and I'm like, this is dumb. And so, like, going up Delano, it took me way longer than it should have. I had to take, like, like taste, and I had to slow my pace down and drink more water. And it was never as bad as, like, like on the Grand Canyon when I talked where my legs just would not work. Like, I could always keep moving, but I just, I could feel it the whole time. And I was like, man, this had better not happen the whole day. And it actually stopped about three-fourths up Delano. And because it was, of that straight to mouth. No, no. <laughs> It was because I like drank like a whole, well, at least a half liter of water, like one of my whole flasks. Do you know what you drank in that first section? How much fluid? Like, were you tracking anything like that? Uh, I drank two liters. How much capacity? That's, that's did a lot you have? for you because you me, never drink that much. Yeah, I drank yeah. two liters on that. So you drank both flasks plus an extra. Yeah, I had my uh, a hydro pack. What's it called? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Camelback. Camelback. Type yeah. Of thing. yeah. So that has two liters in it, and that was full, and I drank half of that too. So. Wow. But on, but on I'm the way, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, by so that's I, the first I actually ever. did. I Usually, did Darren doesn't eat or drink when we're for out thirty there. miles. Yeah, so yeah. I was doing better. I was thinking about that. So for the rest of the day, I didn't take any more supplements, and I never cramped up again did, after that. Did so. you? Did you take like the gnarly electrolyte mixes at the aid stations? The first one. 
the first aid station, I had that, and I was like, gosh, that tastes gross. <laughs> and then also that with the STM pack, I don't know, maybe that just caused some kind of an imbalance in me, but I cramped up after that. And so as soon as I worked past it, I never cramped up for the rest of the day. I just drank water, and technically I did drink some Canada Dry later, but not at this point. But I never... You know, maybe, maybe this is the hard part here, but... Maybe the problem with this section is that that first section, you're so excited and the the trail is so good and whatnot that we aren't realizing just what we're doing. Because when you think about it, by the time we get to Delano, which is still what I would consider feeling early in the race. Oh, yeah, it is. We've climbed higher than climbing out of the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah. Right? Like we've already done 5,000 feet of climbing. So... I don't know. Maybe we're just being overly hard on ourselves and we're not like And you're at like that. mile 12 by the time you hit top of Delano? Uh, maybe 11, 10. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So one thing I could feel, though, is that the altitude. You know, like I could just feel my energy just not where it usually is as I got closer to the top. And so I got used to it throughout the race, but I definitely felt it the most right there at the top of Delano. Yeah. I don't know if you felt that way, but... I think my only thing that I can figure out is that it has, there's only two factors that I can think of that could have caused my cramping, especially that early in the race. One is like, like a race jitter, Mm -hmm. like, you know, just like either a higher heart rate or things like that. But when I, when I was checking my heart rate, like it didn't seem crazy high. Like it was definitely not like, you know, staying in the one fifties or something like that. Um, like for most of this race, I think my, actually my average heart race, according to, and I do need to say this, I am, I used a Koros watch for this one. We're testing out Koros watches right now instead of my Garmin watch. And there may be discrepancies in, in accuracy, right? But last year, my average heart rate for the whole race was 126. And this year it was 113. So like I had a lower heart rate throughout the whole race. So, but it could be just like pre-race jitters. Or the other thing is just I didn't do a lot of training at altitude, at least yeah. run training. You know, the week prior, we did 100 miles on the Colorado Trail. So I was at altitude a lot. So acclimating to altitude, I think, was there. But I just didn't specifically run at altitude. So yeah. I kind of what you're saying right there, like, that could be one of the things that I have to chase down to to learn more about my body is, is just, hey, like, what happens to me when I run at 10,000 feet? or 11 or 12,000 feet compared to six, seven, eight, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, for sure. I think my coral swatch had me like at 110 for my average for the day. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's not, not crazy high. No. You know what I mean? Not, not crazy high compared to what it could be. So, so you get up Delano, get up you Delano. had your cramps. Yeah, yeah. It all passed by the time I got to the top and then I was able to jog down. Like it's mm-hmm. pretty dang steep coming back down. So, Stupid so there's steep. no running for me. Dude, like I, I, my whole goal for this race was not to get hurt. So like I, I just jogged. Well, yeah. <laughs> the, the whole goal was to finish. Okay. Right? That's then, goal one. And then goal two, I said on the last one was to not get and hurt. And goal three was to meet David Goggins at the finish. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah <no. laughs> <laughs> so ran down and I was I was running with this guy. His name was Tim. He was a good guy. And there were some flags all over this outhouse, like this this bathroom out there. And we're like, oh we gotta turn here. And we actually oh, you went on the skyline trail? Yeah. Oh no. So we we turned the wrong direction and ran. My watch wasn't giving me any notifications that we were going the wrong way. And so we're like, where's the flags? And he's like, is He's like, I, I don't know. I was like, okay, well, let's look at our phones. And we had to backtrack. So we, we actually ran a, half a mile in the wrong direction oh and had to get back on trail. So the things we learn, you know. Oh <laughs> this, remember, this is my first ultra, my first race. So uh, I'm learning. <laughs> I, I'm learning. It was, it was this guy's first 100. He did the 70K last year, and this was his first 100. So. Oh. Um, but we got back do you on. Think oh, you ate, but, drank well during yeah, that section. Yeah, d- did well. I actually ran past your family during this section. They were hiking mm-hmm. up to go meet you, and uh, I was I was feeling great. You know, like nothing was hurting. Everything was going good. I was drinking. I was eating my skittles, and uh, <laughs> Dude, he had like a he had like a full pound of skittles in his in his vest pocket the night when I hey it saw worked. Him. 
Don't knock it until you try it. It's good. <laughs> carried those all day, but I did. I did. <laughs> But yeah, I ended up getting to that next aid station and it, it was, it was fine. It, it worked out really good. Any like idea of how much fluid you consumed? A uh, liter. One liter in that whole section. I'm pretty sure it's just a liter. Gosh. For the rest of the race, for, for the rest of the race, <laughs> for each station, it was a liter to a liter and a half. Between I, each one. Yeah. But the thing is that that's not all I had. When I'd get to the aid stations, I would drink a full liter right when I got there and have them refill everything. And then I'd like have like a cup for their can to dry or something. So I hydrated at the aid stations. And then in between, I'd have about another liter and a half. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Very interesting. So. Uh, I, I guess going out of there, you went to a different aid station. This is so. This is where the 100k versus the yeah. 70k start to deviate. Um, I went up to a station called Mud Lake, which you go to next after this this intermit mud st- or aid station. But um, yeah, so I get up there. I I fill up my stuff. So my my whole thing was I was filling up a two liter water bladder. Um, in my backpack every time with my mixes and then one liter on my chest, essentially two 500 or milliliter flasks. So I was carrying three liters between every station and my first two stations, I finished it and under both. So getting to the first one, I had finished my three liters getting through up and over Delano. I, I finished that one. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm six liters in by the time I get to mud Lake refill with my three liters. And at this point I'm thinking I'm cramping up pretty significantly right before the aid station. And so I'm thinking I just have to drink more. And this next aid station, uh, this next section, I thought that I was going to be able to run it even faster. The year previous, I ran it in two hours. So I was kind of hoping I could, I could do that again and potentially, I don't know, you know, hydrate a little bit extra getting that liter and a half per hour that I was aiming for. Um, so I head out of there, I do that section and kind of the same thing. I was able to move down the mountain really quite effectively running. And, um, so that the first part of the section went really well, got to the climb and I had to dial it back to not cramp. I, well, this is a big climb because you're dropping down to Blue Lake, right? And 1,600 feet down, 1,600 feet up. Yeah, so it's 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 another really steep one coming out of there. It's fairly steep. It's the easiest to this point, though, <laughs> like of the yeah. first three the segments. Downhills. Yeah, yeah, it is the easiest uh, that I had been to, so it's kind of like, oh, I know this section's easy. And I did it really well the last time, so I was expecting another really good segment here. And I actually just pulled this – these stats together. So this is new information for me, but it looks like I ran it 30 minutes slower. Mm. Now, some caveats here. Um, so one climbing out of it on the, on my last climb out of it, I felt super good. And I remember just charging up the mountain, passing people feeling really good. This time I passed like one guy and was just again, riding that line of cramping, so I was, I was, when I'd get too crampy, I'd slow down a little bit and just take a few sips of water. And then I'd kind of slowly ease pace back up. Um, I think I only had to fully stop once or twice to let a cramp pass. Um, but it, it held me back, but this section also had about 0.6, 0.7 miles of extra mileage because they moved the aid station because they claimed they couldn't get to the other spot. So because of snow. Which, which I would argue now after being up there, it, yeah, it, it was, melted it, it was plenty. Go, it was gone. It, it had melted plenty. So, so they added an extra, I mean, on the day that adds an extra like 1.2 miles to my race. Um, so there is and at the average pace of the day and whatnot, that might've added 20 minutes. So I might've just done this section more like 10 minutes ish slower. Um, but I, I was actually, I'm kind of surprised to see here and look at this. Cause I'm like, Oh, I thought I would have cut off a little bit of time in that section, but it looks like the climb out cost me. Um, you know, it's funny how you always see the things that you can't do and think that those would be the biggest improvements. Right. So last year when I was unable to run, it was like, well, if I could have run, I would have made up 
hours of time, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And then this year when it's like, well, I can run if it's flat or downhill, but then the climbing I can't do very well without cramping, you know, then it's, and you just, you just kind of, I don't know, it, it all is interesting, right? But so I get through that section. I finish the three liters of water and it is hot by this it's point. so hot. <laughs> so <laughs> much hotter. Like, um, just, just, yeah, very palpably it was, it was hotter. The three liters went down pretty dang easily, I would say. And the next aid station is just hot and exposed in the sun. I remember getting to that aid station and looking around at people and just seeing that they were like low on fluids and they're hot. And there was a kid that, that I had run this race with the year previous. He finished just a little bit after me. Um, so very similar time. And, you know, he was there like not looking good. And I'm like, like dude, heat and stroke. Yeah. Like yeah. really red looking and he was pulling his shoe off and he was having some issues. And, um, I actually ran part of that section section with him talking with him. And then, um, we kind of separated, but, um, yeah, when he got in there, I kind of walked over and just looked at him and I was grabbing stuff off the table and he just didn't look like he was in a good spot. And I said, I'm like, yeah, dude, it's, he's like, it's so hot out here. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I ran out of water on that climb. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I'm like, I'm carrying three liters between each section. And he's like, he's like, well, I, he's like, yeah, I'm taking 50 ounces. And I'm like, that's a lot for usual, like for <laughs> usual. But, um, I think if I didn't do my math right, I was carrying closer to 90 ounces yeah. and I was still finishing 90 ounces. And this kid's, he, I mean, he's, he's probably a little bit smaller than me, but not, not significantly. Right. Um, especially like, like weight wise, he's probably similar. And so, you know, he's, he's 40 ounces under me in that section. And anyway, so I just remember kind of seeing some of those things. Um, and that he ended up DNFing. He didn't, he didn't yeah. finish this year versus last year he finished. Right. So, um, just, it was brutally, brutally hot. But. Yeah. Well, last year you guys were kind of dancing with storms the whole day. Like it was, it was overcast, overcast and the clouds were moving all around and I don't know how you didn't get a bunch of rain because yeah. I was watching it really close last year and you're like, no, we didn't get that much, but I, I didn't get it had to be, everyone else did. Yeah. It had I to did. be like, <laughs> yeah. When we were, when you're we were at the, were at the lodge, dumped yeah, on. I was on the start line. Yeah. Getting hammered. <laughs> get, but, yeah. Yeah, so that that had to be good for at least fifteen degrees cooler. Well, I think it probably it probably pulled like yeah, like ten degrees off the mountain. But not only that, last year versus this year, we've been having like a heat wave, you know. I mean we were just mm-hmm. in Colorado sleeping at ten twelve thousand feet and can't get in our top quilts because we're so hot, right? Like I've never in my life had that. And it's and it's just kind of been the theme here. So I think just overall we were probably averaging five plus, you know, five to eight degrees hotter every day, um, to this point in the summer, but not, but then mix that with the lack of the rain dancing. And so, yeah, I think it was probably about a 10 to 15 degree different swing for me year yeah. over year. It's that La Nina year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, it was hard. So, so anyways, how did the sections go for you? So you essentially from your spot went from the skyline uh, aid station up to the mud lake yep. and then over to the bullion one that I was, that I just went yeah. to. So. so, I mean, that was, it was a good section. Um, so we did go over to mud lake and that was a tough hike. I uh, was just getting over to mud lake. I, this we've hiked that sec, like we've hiked up we, and out of there yeah. and it's, it's a climb. It is. And so at this point, at this aid station, the guy, uh, Tim that I was hiking with, he, he stopped, he tapped at that point. Like he, really? he was, tapped at mud. He tapped at mud. Was what was he struggling with? He started cramping, you know, in in between stations there. So he he stopped, and I just kept on going. Uh, I kept on like as far as like hydration wise, uh, kept doing the same as what I had been doing, just drinking what I had, refilling at the stations, and then just kind of eating my snacks as I kept going. I do remember on this section though that I was wearing my altitude hoodie, and there was bugs everywhere, like just horse flies and. Yeah, so many flies. Like something stung my arm and my arm went numb. Like (laughs) like I don't know what that was, but I could barely grip my trekking pole during this this (laughs) section. And it went away. But I do remember just like 
cussing really loud <laughs> <laughs> and, and just keep, kept on going. But that was the most memorable part of that section for me. It was just like, man, my arm doesn't work, you know? And wow. I was using my arms a lot with those trekking poles to keep my body going. <laughs> and, just dragging that. Yeah, so, my, so going down to Blue Lake, that section is actually good going down. Like, that flew. But at the bottom, like Taysen said, it was hot. Like, it felt like hell on earth. And... It's like, like exposed. Yeah. Like the rocks are just they're, like they're, reflecting they're, back on they're you. They're absorbing the heat and then it's reflecting back on you. a lot of that you. black shell yeah. shining right back at you. And there was this, yeah. another guy I started, you know, running with and he seemed like he was in great shape and he was running the whole time. And I was just keeping up with this guy and I think that he had dehydration because right when we started climbing out of that, um, he like just stopped. Like he DNF too, and so as far just as like goes, yeah, yeah, like it's he, a hard place to drop because so, there's yeah. no one getting you out. Of yeah, there. exactly. You still got to hike back up to get to Bullion. That was the one mm-hmm. we we're going to, and so that was Go a set. Back to mud. <laughs> yeah, well, it was like the very end, so we'd already passed the lake and we'd made yeah. it to that. But at least that you get back to the skiers are easier instead of like a four hour car ride. Yeah, but I just remember like trudging up that last road, thinking it it was never going to end just because it was so hot. But I did it well. Um, and it was a hot part of the day, but I do remember at this point of the day for me, it started to get a little bit overcast mm. and that really helped me out. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So I guess from, from Bullion, um, I'll yeah. let you, I'll let you do this section. I guess I'll, I'll let you keep talking because this you is your yeah, this, this is, is the where the hundred K guys deviate once again from the 70 K course, they do an out and back. Um, it's super easy, right? Mm. <laughs> so at this point, yeah, it looks super easy. This point is where you realize how far behind the pack you actually are, and because uh, you see everyone, because everyone that's coming back that's done, you're just like, oh, you're like, oh, oh man, I've got four miles till I get like, down. How, there. how are you on your way back? Yeah. And uh, dang, yeah. So I'm just starting, and there's all these guys coming back. Like, oh man, I'm going way slower than I thought, you know, and. I'm not really paced, and I'm just trying to go. So you walk all the way down Bouillon, um, and it, I can't you follow I, the road for a while, and then you cut off the road, and then you like. What you is like it called? Co- Copper, Bell? Is Copper yeah. Bell Peak? Is that Copper Bell Peak? Copper Bell and Water Drop are right there. Yeah. So the Water Drop. But what's probably frustrating about this is from where you're sitting at the aid station, you can probably see where you're turning around. Like the entire Oh, yeah. Time. You can, yeah. You, you so can see like it the you whole time. You look across this big basin to this big peak, and it's like, that's, well, that's where we're headed. Yeah. Like, and <laughs> so so I, I did my same thing like at, at Bouillon. I got, you know, drank my liter of water there, and I filled up, and I went. And then the next aid station actually comes up pretty quick where they have the water drop. It's like only four miles down the road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you hardly drink anything because you're going downhill. It's a road, and it, it wasn't that bad. And so I, I distinctly remember there was someone coming out that was filling up her water, and she's like, you're going to want to fill up. I'm like, oh, I, my bottles are basically full. I'll be fine. And so I just kind of blew past that water drop, and I just kept on going. And then you walk until you get to the base of this mountain, and then it's just a shale, bald mountain with nothing <laughs> of uphill. And it's some mountain above goats. tree line. There's probably some mountain goats. Yeah, well, I didn't see any. Yeah. Like so, if they're just, there, like they're just mountain crazies, just, <laughs> just vultures <laughs> waiting for the runners to. Yeah, die. exactly. <laughs> so, I actually did see a spring coming out of the mountain. I I didn't know it was a spring. I thought it might have just been runoff, and so it, the trail kind of zigzags back and forth, going up these switchbacks. And I noticed that the water wasn't above the switchback. So I'm like, okay, on my way back down, I'm going to get some water here from the spring. And that was like one of the best things I ever did. It was best water of the day. But I ended up getting up there and there was this, another guy that was saying, that was the worst part of my day, you know, trying to get up this mountain. He's like, and at the very end of it, they just punch your, your bib with a little stamp, you know, and like, that's it. I was like, man. No hugs or there's yeah exactly champagne no, or no hugs or water up there like it's just a I don't know it's a death march to the end of that and just so straight I, up I, a peak and back down exactly and then yeah. at this point there was like I saw maybe three people behind me and on my way back 
Um, I got some water from that spring and I didn't pass another hundred K or <laughs> coming up. So I'm like, <laughs> Oh man, I'm at like the back of the pack. <laughs> so a little on that <laughs> out of the 103 people that signed up to do the hundred K 46 either didn't show up or DNF'd. And so I don't feel too bad about where I ended up on this race. So like <laughs> yeah. it's a 50% drop right about. So yeah. so when you're seeing that you're like at the back of the pack like that, so, yeah, what I, were you I, thinking? I had no idea. I'm like, oh my gosh, like how slow am I? Because I did not feel I was going slow at all. Yeah. Right. And uh, I was just keeping it a pace. I was like, okay, I just got to keep doing what I can do comfortably and not get hurt and just keep on going. And so at this point, I'm just, it's kind of demoralizing thinking, if I can stay ahead of those guys, I'm going to finish. And so mm-hmm. that, that was my goal. It's like, I'm going to stay ahead of those people behind me. And so, so what miles, what, how many miles would you be at when you hit to the top, the top of Copper Belt? Do you know? Uh, I could reverse into it I really could, quick. I could find out. You were probably around 20? Um, 23 minus 60. So he's like at mile 40 oh, by the okay. time he gets back to bullion a second okay. time. Yeah. Mile 40 out of 65. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. He's probably at mile so 42. How, so how then, much gas dude, did you have in the tank? That's crazy to think about. When you're there, I'm almost like I would be in the last segment of yeah, that, my race. See, that was the thing. Like it was plenty oh, of daylight. That was plenty of daylight. That's terrible. You know, like I was actually thinking that. I was like, yes, I'd be about done with Taysen's race if I was doing the 45 miles right now. Oh, no. And it's like when I got <laughs> back to like Bouillon, I was like, well, I just got this. So. I, I was feeling great. I actually ran across uh, Taysen's cousin at this point. Oh, did you? Jesse. Jesse? And uh, he was just... Was he at the aid station? He was p- walking past it. So, Like leaving it? Yeah. As you were leaving it too? Well, I was getting back to it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's just leaving. You're just getting there. So he's yeah. like, what, 10 minutes up the trail from you? Or? Yeah. Really? Okay. So we were pretty close when I when I saw him leaving from that section. So... Energy wise, how much energy did you feel like you had? Uh, I was I was dehydrated at this point. I know that, but energy wise, and I you had a bee sting. I had a bee sting. Yeah, did that bother you or affect? At, at this point, no. I was it was, was more. Uh, motivation. I got stung by a bee that day, and my leg is still fat. Yeah, it's like my whole ankle. My, I, yeah, I still well, I still have swelling, but yeah, I like second cousin got stung. By a bee and said he couldn't breathe the rest of the race. Like he was like uh, struggling to breathe. That's yeah, super sketchy. I think that's called anaphylactic shock. And <laughs> I don't know. I was so upset band, with it. Ultra runners don't <laughs> listen to any doctors. All right. Yeah. They yeah. don't care about we'll, uh, doctors. Yeah. We'll get more I, I was on using that later. it. I was using it as fuel. I was like, okay, that pain is going to help me go further. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be 100 percent honest. I I like super feel bad for you. Like just realizing that you're there. And nearly to the end of like my race is, is just insane. Like why? Because um, you're thinking he would have had a good time on the seventy. No, what I'm thinking is um, how demoralizing go. it would be to be there and know what I still had ahead of me. Oh yeah. Like I I can't wrap my head around that. So essentially, what that would mean is that um, about halfway to the next aid station. So me and Bo- so if we leave Bullion. We're headed to this aid station called Miners Park, yep. and it's about seven and a half, eight miles away. And so, my thought would be that halfway through that, you know, that would be the forty-five mile mark. Probably not the same climbing or whatever, but like, um, that's that's just that's. I'm trying to because like because what happens is like later in the race when I'm running, I just keep thinking about Darren, and I, and honestly, Darren. I'm thinking, I hope Darren drops. Like, <laughs> not not because I don't want you to finish, but because I'm like, he's going to hurt him. Like, like this is just too hard today. This is they j- the race they put together, the extra miles, the extra climbs. The heat. The heat. The like, heat. I'm like, I don't know how it would be physically possible to do the 100K. Like, because I knew I couldn't do it, right? So, like, my thought was, I couldn't do the 100K. There's no way I could have done it. Um, like without just, just destroying myself. And so my thought was like, I just, and I know you, and I know that you won't drop. So my thought was like, 
gosh, I hope Naren just just if he <laughs> if he gets to a position, I hope he will drop instead of do something stupid like yeah. die um, like, like, yeah. like die on the mountain. I am here. Um, <laughs> so like that's that's what I was thinking, and I was thinking that later in the race. But anyway, so we run down yeah. to to miners. I this is a section that really pissed me off mentally. The reason is. Last year, I wasn't able to run this section because my legs were all messed up and hurting so bad. And I just, I mean, I just couldn't run period. And you can go back and listen to all of the details on that. But, um, I was able to run this time. So I'm jogging down the trail and like, it's not easy and it's not fun. It's like, it's like the grind and the pain cave, but I'm, I'm jogging down, I'm moving quick and I'm like, sweet. Like I'm going to get down there quick. So I text my family. I'm like, I think I'm going to be there at like three ten, making good time. And, um, then like a couple miles down the trail, all of a sudden that trail just gets steep yeah. as can be loose, you know, like loose dirt, loose rocks. And it's getting so steep that I have to pull my trekking poles back out because I'm like, this is, this is actually difficult without some extra stabilization with where my legs are at. Right. Well, there's caution signs up there. You know, if there's cliffs, if you there's go cliffs. too far, you're going to die. <laughs> you will fall off the cliff. <laughs> So I was very frustrated because by the time I got to the end of this section, um, you know, I'm still fighting cramps. Um, those never go away. And, and it, I just didn't run the section as fast as I thought I could. And I was like, dang it. You know, it's, it's one of those things going back to where I was like, when you can't do something, you think you can, like, you know. So I thought that whole section was going to be super runnable. I even told other runners, like, can we run this section? I'm like, oh, totally. This section is going to go be the fastest of the race. It's all downhill. It's all runnable. And then you get there and you're like, well, like 25% of it was runnable, <laughs> you know? So I was very just like mentally frustrated. I remember at this point, um, I tried to like squat down next to a Creek and just, just get water and throw it on me. And I started cramping up. And so I'm like, well, screw that. Like that's not worth it. And so I remember this section being really hot for me. Um, because it, it can be pretty dang exposed as well. Um, also watched a life flight helicopter circle around a bunch and p- pick someone up. Um, so someone was, you know, DNFing and mm-hmm. getting life flighted out of there. Hope they're all right. But just a brutal, brutal day. Um, and a section that I felt like should have been easy ended up being fairly brutal. We dropped 30, at least for me, I dropped, well, both of us in this yeah. section. It would have been uh, uh, over 3,200 feet of descent. Um, and 400 feet of climbing. So almost no climbing comparatively on the day. So that puts you around 8,000 feet. So at this point, descent, I've descended 9,400 feet. By well, the I mean, bottom. I mean, your, your elevation there would have been right around 8,000 feet. Right? Yes. Yes. It's so pretty much got right some at some monster 8, climbs coming up after that hottest e- e- monster point. Monster to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> So get to Miners Park. I'm like 30 plus minutes behind where I thought I was going to be meeting the family because this is the one aid station they can actually crew and help. And so I get in there and sit down and I am feeling significantly better than the year previous, meaning I'm not slurring my speech. Yet. Face wasn't numb. <laughs> my face isn't numb and twitchy. I can still feel my fingers, um, you know, and I've been drinking. I've been hitting my marks. So at this point in the day, Let's see, there's one, two, three, four. So I've drinking 12 liters of water by this point in the day. It's 340 or something when I get in there. So it's like, I've been putting water down, doing all this kind of stuff. I've been getting calories in. And so in a lot of ways, I was in a much better position getting to this point. Um, but again, just, just cramping, right? So sat there for a minute. This was the, I took my longest break here. Um, I, I tried to break this down. I don't find it fully accurate, but it looks like I took a 20 minute break here. Um, they definitely don't feel like that, but you know, and I think there's some start and stop delay. I'm trying to pull extrude that out of a watch mm-hmm. very well, but took a longer break here, ate, ate, drink a part of a monster and, um, filled up my, my stuff and, and then, um, took off out of there for me when I left this aid station. I had a pacer now. So this is the first time I've ever run with a pacer, but Eric, for those of you guys that have watched some of our previous videos, Eric has come on trips with us. He did rim to rim to rim with us. Um, he's a buddy of mine from, from high school and college. And so he came down to do the last 16 miles with me and pace me. 
Um, so I picked up him at that point, but I would say like, if I'm sitting there in that chair at that point and I'm looking at what I've got ahead of me, I'm thinking, oh yeah, like I'm not as far ahead of my pace last year as I thought I would be at this point. But last year, this is where my whole race went to crap. Like, like I, I literally on the, like on the last section. So I, so the last section is the first section. You just run it backwards. Right. And so I think about it, like in the first, uh, the first time of the day, you run it in two hours. Well, last year when I was going backwards down it, which is actually a net descend versus a net gain, um, it took me three and a half hours. That's how much slower I was first to last section last time. So I'm thinking, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to shave off like big time on all of these sections. Um, so I'm feeling good as I'm sitting there and yeah, Darren, how did that section go for you? And how are you feeling at Miners Park? Um, so from Bully on to Miners Park, right? Where mm-hmm. it's a big downhill and down mountain, down Let's mountain, not even call hill, downhill, down it's mountain, a friggin mountain. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the times, pa- dude, we pass, I gotta say this. We pass some ladies on horses. This is the best part. We passing these ladies on horses. They're just riding up, looking all good. Got their makeup on, their cowgirl hats on, their boots on, on these <laughs> nice horses. They're drinking their white claws, and we're like, "Damn, that looks." That Matt, looks I know so this good. girl named Megan, <laughs> and she's like, she's just like, "What the heck are we doing here?" You know, like, and I'm like, "I don't know. That looks that looks amazing." You know, and um, she stops and pets the horses for a while. And I'm like, "All right, guys, I gotta get out. Like, I can't just stand here for ten minutes for a horse stop." So I'm like trying to get around him and get around him and Megan catches back up. And uh, no, 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 no. Before that, though, they're like, oh, you guys are almost there. You're almost there. And we're like, no, we're yeah, not. like, and they're like, aren't you excited? And we're like, well, that's just the next aid station. And they're like, well, where's the end of your race? And we're like, oh, we go down to the bottom of here and then we climb back up to the ski resort. And both of these cowgirls faces look like they've just seen ghosts. <laughs> they just start dropping profanities like, what in the heck? Are you, are you kidding me? You're insane. What's wrong with you? Like just going off. They're like, cause they thought they're like, we've been telling everyone that they're almost done with their race. Cause they think we're just running down the Canyon and that's it. You know, sure like, no, no, no. we still got 16 miles. We've got to climb to the top of this mountain again. Oh yeah. And it was, it was so comical. That's but funny. Anyways. Yeah. I, I would trade <laughs> spots to be on a horse for sure. Oh, yeah. Anyways. So times a day, I mean, you got to think of this, like Taysom's probably getting here when I there's plenty of sun. I got to Miner's Park at about 3.30. Okay. Yeah. For me getting to Miner's Park, I was starting to run in the dark at this point. Yeah. Like it was getting dark for me at this point. Yeah. So on the way down, yeah, it was a really nice gradual downhill until I got to that steep spot that Taysom was talking about. And... I had to slow right down and I'm full on using a headlamp at this point. And so that was, that was slow going and pretty sketch because this point it did start raining on me. Yeah. Right. As it got dark, as it it got dark, it started raining on me at this point. And I was like, it felt behind me. (laughs) It felt so good, but it was dark and I had this, you know, all on me and, you know, I was just like, okay. And it was good until I got to the bottom. And then I was like, man, I am tired. Like I get to the That's bottom. That's a good place to realize you're tired when you have a 4,000 <laughs> yeah. foot climb ahead of you. Yeah. And I, I don't know how much <laughs> oh. further it was from the very bottom of that to get to the aid station, maybe like another mile or mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. But at so this, it was at this like point. So probably like 8.30 PM or no, probably nine ish. Probably nine ish at this point. When you're getting down there. Yeah. Nine PM. It's like at this point for sure hit my first wall. Like I got my phone out thinking I was going to text my wife saying, I don't know if I can do this. I didn't have service. (laughs) And so I was like, I'm just going to keep going. And then not even like 30 seconds later, I see the bright lights of that aid station. And I was like, oh, thank goodness, you know. And I was like kind of, oh, so kind of back up. Backing up the trail, I see like these random dark piles like in the road i'm like man someone wait wait you're not a this is before miners still so this was right before miners so the second to the last aid station right yeah okay so So you're in the bottom still yeah when you see these piles so i see these piles and and there's like someone who's puking and i was like man that's kind of gross but it's black and uh, i get to the aid station you know after i had my little wall there and uh 
I sit down and I start relaxing and this guy asks, like, how you doing? I'm like, I'm tired. And it's like, and I'm feeling queasy, but I'm still doing good. Like, I'm glad to be here. I was way more moralized because I had the, uh, you know, the food, like the, the drinks that are going on there. And so I still felt really good. You're still you know, going just, for pickles? Oh, yeah. Pickles and PB and J's. Uh, pickles, PB and J. I couldn't stomach couldn't, at this point yeah. anymore, but I could still do it. The pickles. So I see this guy, and he's like, "How you feeling?" I'm like, "I'm doing good." And I'm like, "How are you?" And he's like, "I'm not good at all." He's like, "I've I've been throwing up blood," and uh, he's like, "Just black tar." And I'm like, "Man, are you getting a tap?" And he, he's like, "Yeah, I've got to." He's like, "I I can't go any further. It's not worth it." And so I was like, man, that is that is too bad to hear. You know, I just felt really bad for this guy. He looked like he did awesome for the whole race. He seemed like he was in good spirits. He was like, but he just, that was it for him. And so at this point, I'm kind of, wait, did I mess that up? Or is, I think I missed that, messed that up. Yeah, I thought that that was before yeah. All Unite. Yeah, it was. So miners, miners is the one in the very bottom before the massive climb on the stupid okay. road. Oh, <laughs> huge zigzag! I mean the fantastic road. So yeah, this would this would have been at miners. This is when you're in the bottom of a canyon. Okay, so when I think, I, I think he's still messed up. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. I got it right. So this this is this, this is the second to the last aid station. Yeah. So this is where this guy was puking. So that's okay. right. Okay. 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 And so I felt really bad for him, and at this point. I'm I'm just feeling queasy, but I knew that there was going to be a freaking big hike, you know, coming up. Like that's they all kind of warned me that this was coming up. So this is, this is the pinnacle dark. of the race. Yeah, this is the pinnacle of the race. You climb four thousand feet straight up. Yeah, like straight up gnarly switchbacks, and then the switchbacks stop, and it's just straight up. Um, so yeah, this is what most people call the pinnacle of the race. It's where most people blow up, have issues, because on the seventy k, I'm thirty miles in. You would be at like almost uh, high forties at this point. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like a lot of people, this is where it's like, if you weren't fueling all day, if you weren't you know eating all day, like you're you're gonna have your issues. So yeah. But getting into miners, how are you feeling? Just, just, you I, thought about tapping, but no service. No service. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep going. I have to hike out of here anyways. Like it's, I didn't, <laughs> that would have been not a bad place to tap. Actually. I did. I did not know how the tap system worked either. So <laughs> <laughs> you just leave, man. <laughs> I just, just keep on going. So I decided I'm going to just keep on going. And I, so I wasn't there for very long, uh, 10 minutes tops. And really? Yeah, it was, That's like where most people take a pretty significant sit down, eat, drink. Yeah. Like I, I tried to just keep going. Yeah. That was my main thing. Okay. And so it just kept going. And at this point, this big climb, just continuing on, it started dumping rain on me, man. Like, it's the worst time to get rained on. Yeah. Like mentally, like morally. It was well, just... Well, it was dark, so he couldn't see how tall the mountain was above him. You know, right. What's worse <laughs> is seeing the headlamps all the way up the top. Yeah. And you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I have so far to go, and this is not easy. And so that that was the worst. I, hiking in the rain was a godsend because all day long it had been so hot. Yeah. And so whenever it rained, I was just like, open it up. You know, I was yeah. like, yeah. come get me. Embrace it. Yeah. Man, well, this section for me was the worst. Um, those cramps I'd been, you know, trying to avoid all day. This is when they really bit me. Um, so heading out of miners, you know, spirits were high. I was feeling good. Lots of lots of positives thinking there's no way I'm not going to, you know, improve time. And, and at this point, too, it's like I know I did an extra mile of running, you know, 1.2 miles or more of running. Um so that's going to be 20 to 25 minutes of extra time. And I know it's been crazy hot. That's something I can't control. And so I'm just thinking like, you know, any improvement over last year, I'm going to be happy with, um, you know, or happier with. And so at this point, it's just like, but I'm still thinking like, man, I'm going to shave off an hour in the last section. I'm probably going to shave off time here. And like, I'm going to still have this kind of goal because I kind of had a goal of, of shaving about two hours off of my time. Last year I run it in 17 hours, pretty much even. And this year I was like, man, if I could run it in 15, I'd feel really happy with that. 
Well, take off out of minors and we get going and I'm like cramping right out of the gate. And I'm just like, Eric, you're going to hate this. Cause like, he's been waiting all day to go running. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then like, it's like, all right, let's go, but let's not go. You can just, you know, <laughs> go super slow, stand here. And anyway, so we're going and I am like fighting these cramps. I'm, um, we end up walking with that girl, Megan again for a little bit. And after a while, I'm like, Megan, you're just going to have, cause at first she's like, if you want to go faster, you can. And I was like, I might pass you cause I feel like I can go faster. And then like five minutes later, I'm like, nope, I'm going to cramp up, go ahead without us, you know? And so, um, it's just really frustrating. Cause like from an energy perspective and like, I feel like from a strength perspective, like could have, could have easily, you know, kicked it up a notch and cruised out of there. And anyway, so it became really frustrating to me because last year we went and walked a road up the mountain this year, they got private access and this is the normal route. Last year was the exception. So this year we were walking this old mining road. Well, something about an old mining road is it's not a road because it's no longer in use. It's also not a trail because it's on private property. And so no one's allowed on this road unless you have special access, which means that it's nothing but Just weeds bushwhacking. And, yeah. and fallen trees. And, you know, it's not like the forest service is coming in and cutting out any trees and it's not like anyone's, you know what I mean? So the only thing you're following is where other runners have gone and beaten down the weeds in front of you. So, I'm like getting frustrated because it's like, man, I really wish we were on the other road. Plus, plus, not to mention, last year we went around this peak called Edna Peak. And this year we had to go all the way up and over the top of Edna Peak, which added 500 more feet of climbing to the race, yeah. which is just like, we didn't need any more climbing. Like, counting this every foot. whole freaking oh, yeah. race yeah. is climbing. And now we've got another 500. So <clears throat> it gets really tough. Um, I get about a third of the way up this climb. I go to, to, I stand on one log to step over another massive log and my leg just starts cramping like crazy. Then, and then like midair, the next leg starts cramping. So I literally just tumble off of this log onto my back and, um, scrape up my hand and I can't move. Like, because what happens to me when I get to this point is anything that I move will start to lock up and cramp whether it's my ab muscle, my back muscle, my IT band, my leg, my calf, my foot, whatever it is I try to move will cramp. So I'm just laying on my back, trying to breathe through these incredibly painful cramps. Eric, um, these ones, at least Eric was there and he like tried to stretch out my calf, which did help, um, help him pass. But then I'm just laying there and I'm like, I can't get up and I don't dare move because if I move, I'll cramp. And so I laid there. And I just was looking it up. I laid there for over 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't move. Meanwhile, some guy wanders up, uh, you know, that he's coming off the mountain and he's saying, yeah, I just did a pulse ox, which is like measuring how much your, your, your blood oxygen content is. And he was in his, in the sixties, which is like, dangerous. You're going to die. Go like, yeah. Like you usually, like you said it this morning that if you're in the eighties, you typically go to the hospital. Well, this guy's in the sixties, so he's tapping out, he's going down the mountain and he can't even pass us because I'm laying in the only way to get across <laughs> this, this log field. So he's just like, Hey, just take your time. Like I'm, I'm tapping out. So it doesn't really matter. Like I need to get to lower elevation, but I'm okay. And, uh, as he's standing there, he finally is like, I think I know who you are. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, he's great. like, yeah, he's like. I've watched your guys' videos before. I saw you did rim to rim to rim, you know? And I'm like, oh man. And then he looks at Eric. He's like, hey, you were there too. And, you know? And so it's like, okay, sweet. Like here's this guy who does YouTube and he's just laying here like a freaking sack of potatoes on the trail, <laughs> looking like an idiot stuck in between a tree and the ground. Film that in the yeah. Grand Canyon? Oh my gosh, dude. It was the worst. <laughs> so We're filming the best parts. <laughs> yep. Yep. We turned the camera off for the worst parts. We didn't even tell you how gnarly it really is out there. Um, yeah, so just, it was just horrible. So then I get up finally, just keep moving down the trail and I'm just fighting these cramps. Um, I met this kid named Alex who from Bozeman, really, really cool kid. Um, he'd hit a really hard calorie wall at miners. And so he was, he was just nursing it in, you know, to finish. Um, 
and we we spent a lot of miles with him at the top of this. But yeah, I mean, we were just it was so steep. Like I I wish I could show you guys just how steep this is. But you have to. So if you were to think about this, um, so it's seven and a half miles from aid station to aid station, two and a half um, come after the peak. So in five to five and a half miles, you climb 4,000 feet. So every mile you're climbing a thousand feet vertically, which is just astronomically steep. And this, this road sucks. I'm climbing, you know, we're climbing over branches, climbing over crap. And then you like do all these switchbacks. And then at the very end, they just say, screw it. We're going straight up, straight up the mountain. And like, so I'm looking at these people ahead of me and they're just vertical above you. And you're like. Really? Like not a switchback? Like we're just coming off the Colorado trail with like these beautiful engineered bike trails. And it's like, these were phenomenal trails, like no rocks, no nothing, great switchbacks. And now it's just like straight. I mean, you, I don't think that the miners could have got up this road without a tracked vehicle. Like they would have had oh, to have yeah. had like a, like a tractor with, with the tracks on it, not wheels. Cause it was just that steep. Oh yeah. Um, and so anyways, I get through that section, starts raining on me right at the top. Um, you know, just, just right in time to be the good lightning rod. And then, um, <laughs> and then we drop straight off the other side and get over to the aid station. Yeah. For me, this section, it was just the worst. It was the absolute worst, um, year over year. Um, the previous year I did this section in three hours and 21 minutes. And if you remember from last year, I had a massive calorie wall and hydration wall had a ton of issues and lost a like probably lost a 30 minutes of time in this section. So I was already thinking like, I only have up to go in this section. Um, like I'm going to improve my time in this section because I'm not hitting a calorie wall. I've been putting down tons of calories all day. I mean, I say tons of calories, but, um, I've been putting down between 500 and a thousand calories between aid stations, which is a lot. Like yeah, most runners are not is. doing that. I was doing that. I was drinking 500 liquid calories between aid stations plus what I could eat. So, I mean, I was doing everything I could because I wanted to not hit a calorie wall on this climb and kill it. So what ended up happening though, is I did this section in four hours and one minute to go eight miles. Just standstill pace last year I did it in three hours and 21 minutes. So not only did I not beat last year, but I lost 40 minutes of time in one segment, um, laying on the ground, you know, yeah, just I think we're going to have to teach Eric some pacing. Yeah. Some pacing. <laughs> what do you mean? Eric was, Eric was fine. He just stood there. He, was, he wasn't pulling or pushing me. I, he, no one could pull or push me. I was yeah. in my own. No. I was like, Eric, you're probably hating this. I'm not talking. I'm not doing anything but whining, you know, like this is a sucky section, man. But, yeah, it was. um, anyway, so that was my section. So. Yeah. It was the same for me. Like other than all the rain, I get, it was basically the same as how you described it. I mean, you I laid in the middle of the I, trail. I wanted to. Mm. It's like, but I at this point, like going up, especially that steep last bulldozer section, I just wanted to die. I was so queasy, and I was just like, I mean, I was drinking the water I had, but I just like I can only drink so much because nothing sounds good at this point, and. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot for me to even add on this section other than I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. I hated every piece of that uphill. Like, just so demoralizing watching those those lights way ahead of me. And at this point, I actually had kind of banded together with like four people that we'd hiked with quite a bit. And there was this one lady that on the flats and going downhill, like I. I felt like I was an hour ahead of her, but as soon as we were going uphill, she just had the steady, strong pace and she'd be right there with me. And I was like, I just need to do what she's doing because she seems to have a lot more energy than I do at that nice, steady pace. Because I, I would go as fast as I could, when I could, and then I'd just slow right back down going uphills, like especially those steep uphills. But when we got to that last all unite aid station, that's, that's when stuff started happening. For me, so, so <laughs> what? What kind of stuff here? So, like I was saying, I was feeling really queasy, and I was like, "Man, I'm, I'm thirsty." And that Canada Dry sure tasted good last time. So, the first thing I wanted was just to drink some of that. And I took a sip, 
And then I immediately started throwing up. Like, I was like, oh, crap, I got to go behind this tent. And uh, I, I went behind, and I was throwing up, and I was throwing up blood. And it was quite a bit. And it looked like coffee grounds, and it looked like tar. And I was like, oh, man. And this this worker that was there that was helping and volunteering, she comes back. She's like, you need to come lay down. I'm like, I need to finish. <laughs> like, no, no. No. It's finish like, throwing it's up or like, finish the race. You are both. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and uh, she's like, no, you need to come lay down. I was like, well, I've got to really finish the race. And uh, she's like, well, come lay down for a few minutes and see if you feel any better. And uh, I get laying down and like she checks on me and she's like, I don't know if you, you should finish this. And I'm like, uh, well, I'll see how I feel. And like she kind of walked around the corner to help some other runners that were getting to the tent. And as she was looking away, I was like, I got to go. And so I get up and go over that little uh, electronic scanner to make sure they knew I was in between aid stations and I kept going. But I don't know if it was the smartest thing. Because I knew I was throwing up blood at this point, and I was just tired and not feeling good. Felt a lot better after I threw up, though, so that was that was helpful. Gives you a little boost. It gives me a little boost, and I filled up my waters, and I just kept going. Probably took me just as long as you to get up that, though, about four hours, if not more. Like, mm. and so I knew. So when we actually got going again, I was able to call. Danny and I let her know like this is my wife Danny and I let her know that I'll probably be done between three and four in the morning that was my estimate Mm -hmm. and I didn't realize kind of what was left of this last (laughs) mile eight mile run and uh yeah that that's kind of kind of where where it left off on that that section so (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so for me in that aid station, it's it's called All Unite or All Unite 2 because it's your second time in. Um, they had a really nice chair like out of the wind and I sat down in it and it was like, it was just so nice to sit there for a second. Some people helped me fill up bottles. They're so helpful. I mean, all of the volunteers were just so helpful throughout the day. Um, Aaron comes and sits by me. I think I might've called him Alex earlier. So it's Aaron. Um, Pacer is Aaron. <laughs> he's sitting next to me and this other kid's sitting next to me and I'm like, dude, what are you doing here? It's a kid that Tyler, you met last year. We sold product to, he then went and bought more products. So he was like running in our altitude hoodie. He was using our Tusher rain jacket. And, um, I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, cause last year he ran it in 14 hours, which was a very, a, a very admirable time for the 70 K. And he's like, I'm dropping. I'm like, why are you dropping? He's like, I, you know, I just, you know, it's, it's a rougher year. I was ahead of pace and then I just blew up and I'm like, dude, like, don't drop. Like, this is the worst place you could possibly drop. He's like, I've already been sitting here an hour and a half, you know, and I gotta, I gotta drive to Kansas for moving tomorrow. And I'm like, dude, you realize like it's over a three hour car ride from here to there. And there's not even a car here to take you. Right. Like, I'm like, this is it's might like, as well walk. The you, two and so and that's what hours. I said. I said, you might as well walk. And he's like, no, no, no. And then he like leaves. And I'm like, I turned to Aaron and I'm like, I might've scared him off. Like, you know, he likes us and he liked me before. I'm like, I might've been too harsh on him or something. <laughs> so he leaves and I fill up my stuff and he comes back and I'm like, dude, I'm just going to say this. Like if I'm being too harsh, tell me to shut the heck up. I'm like, walk out of here with us and finish this race. And he's like, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm like, sweet, man. So me, Eric, Aaron, and uh, I'm going to forget his name. Dang it. But um, he wa- he he cruised out of there with us. And, and uh, so at this point for That's me, cool. leaving that aid station, it was like, I think I hadn't done enough mental math to realize how much behind pace I was. In fact, looking at this now, I'm actually 30 minutes behind pace compared to the year previous, which is like, it's actually 20, 22 minutes. It's pretty hard to say that because it's like, gosh, really like a year of training, a year of work, a year of dialing and nutrition, a year of all this stuff. And I'm even at this point behind my pace from the year previous. The good news was I knew I could run still on the flat ground and I knew I could run um, downhills at least a little bit. And so I'm like, there's still that hope for me. Um, and I'm, and I'm uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm leaving though. And I'm just thinking like, okay, I can still finish in a good time. What if I could do this in 
this section in two and a half hours or something like that. And it's a net net downhill. And so anyway, so start the section and we start going and there's a couple really steep climbs. They're not super long, especially compared to what we've done in the day, but like they're just so steep. And so I'm like, crap, I have to get up those without cramping. You know, if I cramp, I go to a complete standstill, right? And so it's like, I'm sitting here like calculating all this stuff. And as we get through the first one and a couple of them, I start to start to do more math. And I'm like, Eric, we're going to have to bust our butts to even beat last year's time at all. And I'm like, and we keep going. And I'm like, like, I'm for real, dude. Like when we break out of this, this last ridiculous climb, we're going to have to push. And then we've got another climb and then we've got some running. And then the last two, three, 400 yards of this race is straight up a hill again. And it's like, it's just the dumbest thing, right? I'm like, we could have, they could have easily wrapped this race around the ski resort and down the ski resort. Oh yeah. And you could have run down the hill like a champion and, and, you know, people cheering all that. No, instead, and this is just what the whole race is about. They make you climb up this super steep hill, up a ski run to the finish line, looking like you're about to die again. Right. Yep. So the whole time in my head, I'm like, if I cramp, even on that last 400 yards, I'm going to miss beating last year's time. So we break out over the edge. I know I've got five miles left and not a lot of time to do it. And so I start just pushing. I just start running as much as I can. And I say running, it, I was, it was, it, it was the most picture perfect <laughs> ultra runner shuffle you've ever seen, man. It was like the most efficient, like <laughs> shuffling you've ever seen, but I was shuffling down the trail, you know, making like, you know, and this is what I mean by this is like, I'm doing like 14 to 15 minute miles. So like go out there and try to run a 14 to 15 minute mile. You're pretty much not running, but you can't walk that 14 minute miles either. So you're just like in this super right weird zone. And so we're cruising just as fast. I'm passing these guys that I've hiked with that passed me on some of the climbs just right there. I pass Aaron. I pass. Um, Was it Ben that walked out with you? No, no. Okay. Um, it was, his name's Aaron Cox. His name's Aaron Cox. No, I mean the one that you convinced to, oh, to turn. Oh, that out. is. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Him. Okay. Ben, Ben yeah. was, that's right. So yeah. he just moved out to, to Tennessee nice. as a, a pretty cool accounting job. He looked at our financial controller job and mm. just couldn't quite make it work. But, yeah. um, anywho, so we make it, I, I make it out, uh, down those sections. We get to the one climb and I'm climbing up it and I'm doing okay. Like I'm not cramping and, and pushing, we get to the top of that and I start running again. And anyways, it's just like go 200 yards, look at my watch, go 200 yards, look at my watch. Like I just can't stop looking at my watch and being like, this is getting so tight. And, um, anyways, I mean, we get down there, get to the last climb and it's like, I'm down to the last few minutes to beat my time from last year. And like get it started up it and, and realize like, Hey, I've literally got 400 yards left and I've got 10 minutes on the clock. Like we did it, you know? Yeah. So got up there, beat last year's time by four or five minutes. Um, got through, um, and I, you know, the, the good of it was I was in a better position. I, wasn't slurring speech. I still had feeling in my hands. Um, my face wasn't twitching. The bad of it is like, I went to sit down in the chair and my ab cramped for 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Like, but it was like, that was just the day, right? Like nothing new there. Um, sat down and, and yeah, had made it. I mean, and, and I guess for me, when I look at, look at, okay, well, it is, it's tough, right? I, I trained for a full year to come back and have vengeance on this race, um, and to do better and, and to improve. And it's really tough when you're like, when you basically beat it by like four minutes, like I didn't train for 12 months to shave four minutes off of a 17 hour trail run. Um, so this is how I break it down personally. If you think I'm pansy and I'm padding my stats, whatever. Um, compared to last year, the race was significantly harder. And here's why, um, number one, like we already mentioned, I think on average, it was at least 10 degrees hotter. Um, if not more throughout the entire day, just like a, like a blanket average. Um, 
And that cost me, right? Because by the time I finished at the finish line, I had drinking 17 liters of water that day and I was still underhydrated. In fact, I'll get to some more stats on that in a minute, but like not, yeah. Two, um, there was an extra mile plus of distance on the day. And that's where I wish that I had not worn, I wish I'd worn almost both watches because the Koros is supposedly tracks less mileage than the Garmin's by up to 5%. Um, that's what people claim. I think it's probably more like one or 2% at times, but I do think that the race was, it was maybe even more than a mile longer with the different climb and the aid station moval. Like they said it was 1.2 miles longer, but I wonder if it was even more. And then three, the climb out of Miners Park. I know I wouldn't have, I at least wouldn't have lost time if we were going on the same road. I may have even improved time. And here's why. I only cramped when I was trying to cross over branches and I was trying to climb over crap. And I just went over like, like if my perceived effort was like a six, it's like if I hit a seven, even for half a second, my body cramped. But if I could control it and keep it right at a six, I would could avoid it and just kind of keep the steady, consistent pace going. And so last year going up the road, one, it's a much more engineered road. There's the grade is way less, and I'm not stepping over boulders, stepping over rocks, tripping on stuff, not climbing over all these downed trees. And I didn't have 500 feet of climbing. And so even that 500 feet of climbing, I felt like that 500 feet of climbing is 20 minutes right there. So to me, like just comparing last year to this year, I do feel like I improved an hour on my time. Um, was an hour my goal to improve? No, it, my goal was really to improve two hours of my time. So it's a, it's a condolence, I guess, in some ways, but in other ways, you know, the bigger issue for me was the cramping, um, to, to cramp that much all day long, that early in the race is still a huge issue for me. And I'm sitting here scratching my head about it. I still don't know because not only did I drink 17 liters of water and eat 5,000 calories in the day, which I think is adequate, very yeah, adequate for a race like this. Um, but when I got on the scale, I didn't even get on the scale Sunday race ends Saturday night, didn't get on the scale Sunday. So I'm eating and drinking Sunday as much as I can. I didn't have a big appetite, but still was eating and drinking. I got on the scale on Monday morning and I was still 10 pounds under my starting weight. So when you extrapolate that, I would guess that I was at least 12 pounds underweight after the race, if not more. And let's say 80% of that is water weight. Um, that means that I really should have consumed like 22 to 23 liters of water that day. And I just don't know if that's realistic. Um, I, I just don't know how I could have really drinking any more water or any more fluid. So I'm definitely like sitting here scratching my head. I uh, will get more to where the future is for me maybe in a second, but, um, yeah, finishing that day way cool. Like just way it felt better to finish in better spirits. I felt good that I at least tired Eric out a little bit by the end. Like he okay. was having to push. I mean, he still did 5,000 plus feet of climbing with me 16 miles and, and he was feeling it a bit, but, um, it was just one of those got to see family members, you know, and just, and, and whatnot. But, um, yeah, didn't, you know, started to get a little shivery, like, you know, jacket, you put a jacket on and stuff, you can kind of get that. But other than that, um, you know, got to the finish line and then we'll talk about the rest of the nights after yeah. Darren crosses the finish line. Yes. Well, that was kind of the next morning, but you know. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it, it, it was the next morning. <laughs> so, so last section, you, you, uh, so you're reminding you, you just puked blood. You just basically snuck blood. away from the aid station. Do you, you know got what eight time miles left. Do you know what time you were leaving? I, with? all I know is that I had estimated because after I got to a place where I could call it was on the top of a hill or a mountain. Um, I had told Danny that I'd be getting there between three and four. Yeah, right. Three and four is my estimate. But there was still quite a bit of climbing in here. I mean, seventeen hundred feet of seven. climbing, twenty two hundred feet of descent. Yeah, and so I wasn't feeling good. There was me and this group of people that were still all hiking together, and two of us kind of pulled away. Um, we just kept going. We're like, hey, if we're going to make this twenty four hour time limit, we have got to go. And at this point, my headlamp had been going for a few hours that morning and it had been going since like nine that, that night till that point. And it was starting to get dim 
And I was like, oh man, I should have brought more batteries. I might have to start using my cell phone here in a minute, like just to get some more light. I, you know, could have done a lot of di- di- different things, like turn it on dim, but I was trying just to get as much as I could. And I was thinking, okay, I'm going to get this done. So when it all, we got past all these little uphills and whatnot, we would run where we could. And the guy that I was with, he was super upbeat. He's like, we're going to make it. He's like, we're definitely going to get there. And I was like, yeah, we are. You know, like we're, we're, <laughs> we're going to get there. And we keep going. Because the cutoff is 24 hours. It's 24 hours. 24 hours five, is the cutoff. So five that, five that morning. And I was more tired than I thought. I, anytime there was an uphill, like I could – maybe get like 50 yards and then have to take a break and I felt like I was falling asleep on my trekking poles at this point like I'd put my head down get so you're my getting like tired tired oh just yeah like, just like fit, sleepy tired tired like sleepy needed tired some caffeine and, yeah I didn't I needed a lot <laughs> I was taking caffeine at the end I yeah. had some like just in electrolyte and gummies and stuff yeah it's and again there was like some switchbacks that we were working up and I knew that we were running out of time and so as we'd get to the top of a switchback, I'd start running it and he'd be running it with me and he would let me lead um, because his headlamp had actually burned out not too much longer before this. Oh, so he's out of a headlamp? So he was using his backup and it's around his neck and it's kind of shining at the ground. So he's kind of like letting me take the lead because I didn't have to put a different headlamp on. And I keep going and for some reason, it was like a dark spot. And my foot landed right in it, and it was this pothole. And my body came right down over my ankle. And at that point, I was like, I messed something up. You know, like, it, it it just hurt a lot. I didn't have a lot of time to, like, finish. There's two miles left in the race at this point. And I told this guy, I'm like, yeah, you just keep going. I'm going to finish. It's only two miles away, but I'm not going to be running it. You know, like, I'll be hiking as fast as I can. And I, I had a, an actual ankle brace in my backpack, like just one of those you slide over. I was like, I don't have time to put it on. So I didn't. And I just kept on going um, just at that hobbling pace I could do as fast as I could. And right at 24 hours, you know, like I, I get to the bottom of that hill and I, I, I walk up and I cross that finish line. And so technically I was a couple minutes over 24 hours. But I definitely don't feel like I didn't make my goal. You know, like I was able to do that 100K. It was longer, like Taysom was saying, than we expected. Mine was supposed to have been 62.3 um, with my deviations. <laughs> <laughs> self-induced. I, I, self-induced deviations. I went well over 65. <laughs> and, uh, 65 miles. And so, yeah, it's like I hobbled over that finish line. Super awesome to see my family there. Everyone was just, you know, they they were proud. Happy you're alive. Happy I'm alive. <laughs> I honestly, I just felt sick. You know, I just like I didn't feel good to my stomach. And I'm like, well, sun's gonna be coming up before long, so let's get going. You're like, and uh, we we start driving down the mountain, and uh, she she drove up a different car. I, and I, I, dr- I can't believe I, you I tried to drive yourself off the mountain, or that you did because. For me, like I couldn't. I mean, I might have cramped up. I might have. Yeah. Like, it was. Well, I. I sketchy. Like, I mean, I wasn't really you're not functioning. You know, it like, was more. It was more mentally. I was. I was out of it than anything. Yeah. It's like I felt sick though. It's like so. I'm driving the truck. Danny's driving the car, and uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel so sick, and I just. I just pulled over. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I've got to go throw up. So it's like, and so it's like, again, here comes some, you know, more, you know, blood and whatnot. And it was like, and yeah, I feel like a lot of ultra runners probably go through that. I wasn't too worried about it. Things kind of settled up after a couple of days, but my foot has been asleep ever since. Well, you, you, you were passing blood for two days. Yes, I was. I was. So you're passing blood for two days, and then this morning you decide to go get an x-ray on your ankle that you so, so, jacked up. So last night I went to the Instacare because I was like, well, why has my foot been asleep for multiple days? Like it, it's either a super bad sprain or something else is wrong. Um, I got the x-ray today, and I had broke my ankle. And so I had found out that I had finished that last two miles – um, on a broken ankle, which you have a it, fractured uh, uh, fibula, 
fibula. Yeah, so that's the outer ankle on the bottom left of my ankle. Okay, so. you should pull up, a, pull up a picture of where the fibula is because I don't know exactly. So that, the ball of your ankle, like right at the bottom of that, there's a, a little fracture. Yeah, I want to – I was going to say, I thought a fibula was like in the shin. So it's on the muscle or it's on the, essentially it's the, the bone that comes on the outside of your like uh, shin area yeah. and so then right down here, into your ankle. Yep, yeah, exactly. So, so right there in that little bony the area. the very bottom. Huh? Yeah. So I'd finished it on that. And so that was kind of cool. It adds to my story. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> so cool, man, to break your uh, the, ankle. The, the thing is, is it doesn't, oh, it doesn't really hurt. It's just numb. It feels like my foot's been asleep for three days. So it sounds super sketchy, dude. And so, but I mean, the things that I learned from this race though, is like, because I went into it, not thinking really not going in with any expectations. I'm like, I, I knew I could do a, a marathon amount of running. I was hopeful I could do a 70K amount. I had no clue and kind of doubts if I'd be able to do 100K. So my whole goal on the thing was to prove to myself that I could go that distance. And yes, there were health issues. I did break an ankle. It's like, but I proved to myself I could do it. And I showed my wife and my kids that, you know, sometimes you can do the harder things in life if you just, you know, just sit down, plan it out and actually follow through on those plans. It's funny because I watch my kids now, they're like trying to run more on the treadmill and Danny's talking about wanting to do a full marathon now instead of a half marathon. And, you know, it's just, it's just really cool to see what the little decisions we make that seems small to us, how it can affect other people. And that's been the coolest thing for me on, on that thing, on this adventure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If you, uh, if you had a fever over the last couple of days, I would have, told you to go to the doctor for rhabdo but um it checked me for a fever no fever yeah so you pushed pushed the limits there quite a bit i think but it's always interesting to see what you can do so yeah yeah. i think yeah i mean um yeah for me like i i think that there's something to doing an ultra um for me, I, I, what I decided is that next year I'm not going to run the same ultra. Um, I don't know what I'll do yet. I need to, I need to figure out because I, I do love setting really big goals, but running it twice. Um, the hard part with, with it is it's a considerable amount of time away from family because you're trading miles, your hours for miles. And oh, so yeah. those hours come from somewhere work or family or something. And so sleep, <laughs> it's tough. But what I would say though, is like get doing an ultra like this and, and, and even to quit what you're saying, right? Like you said, Oh, I didn't know if I could do hundred K dude. I would say you could do a hundred miler just, you know, in a different terrain. Like oh, yeah. people don't, I, I don't think you can fathom, you know, I don't know your stats, but I know my stats and my stats are, um, that I did over like 12,500 feet of climbing. And, um, yeah, according to Garmin, I imported this from the Coros. It says 53,000 feet of climbing, but that's not right. (laughs) Um, um, again, and again, I think this is one thing that I want to work out and talk with Coros about is I'm not so sure about the, the elevation stuff, but, um, I don't know if it's anyways, but but yeah, last year I did over 12,000 feet. This year it was over 12,500 feet of climbing. Um, that's just so much. Like, in fact, like Aaron, uh, texted me after the race is like, you should come do like the big horn one. And I'd heard of the big horn. I'm like, Oh, it's climbing through the mountains yeah. in Wyoming. Right. Well, I looked it up and, and in the 30 miler, you do 3,800 feet of climbing. Oh, wow. It's like, that's one segment yeah. of what this race is, you know? And I had another kid that, that, um, we run with is kind of a, a, a distant family relative as well that he runs it pretty much every year. And he actually gets a coach to, to help him with mm-hmm. this. And he said, he was asking his coach why she'd never run this race. And she's like, well, if I'm being totally honest, this race scares me. Like, I don't want to do it. It's too difficult. It's too intense. Right. Like with all the climbing and, um, and so to me, like, I think you could do a hundred miler and, 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 and I think there's anyways, but going back to it, like, um, I think, yeah, I think running an ultra like this gives you a perspective, um, 
uh, that you can do something that, that you push a limit that you didn't even know you had to push, right? Like you you hit this wall and then you hit the next wall and then you hit a third wall and then you hit oh, a fourth yeah. wall. And you're, you know what I mean? You're just pushing past these barriers that teach you like, okay, like I really know what it's, what it's like now. And, you know, I don't know what it's like to run a hundred K. I have no idea. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's five years down the road for me after a lot more learning and diagnosing and stuff, but, um, or maybe it's never, I don't know, because I don't think I'm built, I I don't think I'm built for this kind of crap, uh, without losing more weight or, you know, just altering my life significant. I have no idea, but, but I do, I would recommend anyone to go and, and sign up for one of these and push themselves to do something like this um, because I think you're going to learn a lot about yourself. And I do think there is, there's a net effect, meaning anyone that's associated or around you also sees this and they grow and they, and it pushes their perspectives. Right. So just like Darren said, like um, I love that my kids are able to see me. They're really young. I hope that they can remember this and, and, you know, just, or even just as throughout life to be able to like, you remember when I did this, well, this is what it was. You know, you can do anything you want um, or, or just anyone else around, right? I think that the other, I think, huge takeaway is humans are just incredible. Um, it's, it's absolutely incredible that we can go those kind of distances, do those kinds of things, abuse our bodies that much, and bounce back. Like, yeah. I would say for the most part, me and Darren, besides this broken ankle, are doing fine. Yeah, um, yeah I'm sore, but, like, there's not going to be any lasting injuries this year, and it's pretty wild to think you can, you can do that kind of stuff to your body and that, that we can handle it. Um, but there's, there's, there's some real emotional mental benefits, I think, to going and pushing yourself, setting massive goals and achieving them. You know, your massive goals don't have to be trail running. Your massive goals can be do the hundred mile challenge with us next year. Um, or if you're in it right now, you, you might be just finishing that up. And, and there's huge benefits and growth in just setting big goals and pushing your limits farther than you thought. Um, because I, I had a, a mentor of mine years ago, you know, he said that he liked to get up and go running uh, because he's like, or, or work out or whatever it was. He's like, if I get up and I do the hardest thing I have to do that, do, th- do that day very first, everything else is easier. I have to do that day. And mentally that teaches me that I can do hard things, Right. And I can get up and get them done right away. And um, there's 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 just a lot of truth to that and a lot of wisdom to that. So overall, um, just a really, really cool day. I, I do want to maybe add in here and, and ask a few more follow-up questions, though, if you don't have anything else, Darren, to add. Nope. Um, was there any pieces of gear that really stood out to you that were just like, man, this, this was a game changer? Yeah, um, there were. Um, and maybe stuff that you would have left behind. So yes and yes. Okay. So I actually made a mental list of this throughout my day. So the Koros watch was awesome for telling me when I was off trail or staying on trail and keeping me up to date with where I was at. So for training purposes, I would highly recommend that for an ultra run or any hiking type of adventure. It's just super accurate, and I appreciate that. Uh, number two were my shoes. Um, I got some Brooks, uh, I actually wrote it down called called Dora Caldera six. And, uh, I didn't have a blister at the end of the day. And I, I just remembered Did all you run regular socks or in gingies. Uh, I had some, what were those prototypes we were using? Like Crip six. Cri- yeah. Crip six. I was using those. Um, but I just remember all day long feeling like my feet are not sore. I'm doing awesome with them. And all day long, like, they were really good. Like, I will buy another pair as soon as those wear out. Sweet. That's and impressive. last on my list was just squirrels not better. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, like, I've never used it before, but I know that on my 30-mile training days, I would start to chafe. So I'm like, okay, I'll try it before this run. No chafing at all. Yep, it's money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So impressive. That, those are my three. As far as things yep. I wouldn't have brought, uh, so I brought like an extra shirt that I carried around all day, like just in case I wanted to have something fresh and I probably wouldn't have brought that. Um, the food I brought, I brought meat sticks and that was not the best choice for, uh, having in my pack all day. Cause I didn't eat it. 
And I could have left it in a drop bag, but I didn't think of doing that. But other than that, everything else, like I brought like a, a water filter and it would have been great, but I didn't realize that my filter is plugged. Like, it, so that didn't work out. Oh no. So I, yeah. I, I would have loved having it and not having it, not having it because it didn't work. Loved having it if it was working the way it should have. It's like, but other than that, I wouldn't have left anything else. I had the right, right gear for it. Yeah. Um, for me, highlight highlight items. I would say um, I do love me my Injinji socks. Those things for running specifically are just money. I just never blister on my toes or anything like that. I actually ran one time for a training run in not the Injinjis, and I blistered um, like earlier in the season. So like I'm I'm very adamant on those. Um, I had the Hoka Speed Goats and. I think I like the fours almost more than the fives, but it's hard to say the fives are still really solid. I hadn't spent a lot of time in the fives before this race. And, uh, but overall the Hoka speed goats are my new favorite shoe. Um, I definitely much prefer them over the Solomons that I had used in the past. Um, scratch the, the car. I wish I knew the new name of it. It used to be called hyper fuel or super fuel, but it's now called something different. Um, but it's it's the liquid calories. I mean, those were absolute money, just constant calories that were easy to get in compared to everything else. Um, so those were, those were huge favorite, probably my favorite switched out piece of gear was I got a different set of Comperdell poles. I mean, I love my Comperdell poles, but I got a running set of poles that have like a full on, um, I don't even know. It's kind of like, like a half like glove. A it's like, yeah. It's like a half glove that really grips your hand. Mm-hmm. And so you don't even have to like grip the pole, which last year, I think that was a big part of why I started to lose feeling in it. And I started to like, you know, even cramp up in my forearms. And so this year I was able to just keep my hands way more relaxed. And I really liked those. They're lighter, thinner. They're not as great. I would say for just hiking purposes, but for running, they're absolute money. Really, really liked those. Um, yeah, other than that, I mean, I used all the all of the Outer Vitals gear worked great. I used an altitude. I used our mm-hmm. Skyline running shorts or trail shorts. I used our Skyline fast pack. Um, that worked great. Um, that thing really works well as a running vest. Uh, it really does. It it's did. it's a little bit. It might be a little bit bigger on the back, like as far as like from a breathability standpoint than a vest. Um, you can cinch it down but real tight. You though. can s- no, yeah. It's not like like, like, like it was cinched. Itself. Yeah, I cinch yeah. mine down and then I tie it just to make sure it doesn't slowly uncinch throughout the day. And from the profile, it's just fine. But like the back panel might be a hair bigger than a vest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just a solid piece. Um, so yeah, those are those are the big ones. Anything I would have left back. Um, no, I really trimmed my pack down even tighter this year. I really didn't take much extras, really didn't take much for first aid. Or I did take a Garmin InReach Mini 2 to track so that my family could follow that. And then I was when, watching it all day. Mm-hmm. And then when Eric met up with me, I gave it to him to carry. That whole shave with another three and a half ounces, you <laughs> yeah. know. So, um, But, yeah, I mean, I definitely overpacked some of those Ziplocs. I overcarried a little bit of food, but nothing that I was, like, ashamed of. I did run out of water on one of the, uh, on coming up out of Minersville. Mm-hmm. So I did fill up a half a liter there, but other than that, drinking just a ton of water. Nice. Um, scratch changed the name from super fuel to super high carb, mm, super high carb sport drink. That's good, good good super descriptive. <laughs> um, cool. yeah, I mean, any, anything, anything we missed Tyler? Um, no, I think I just want to say I'm proud of you guys for such big efforts for putting the time in to, to, well, for setting a big goal and then putting the time in to, to try to accomplish something like that. It's, it's always cool when you can, uh, push yourself to a new level and, and it does have a net effect on the people around you. So I want to say that. And then I think the, the last thing I would ask is just kind of like, how does this apply to the rest of your time in the backcountry? like for backpacking Mm. and for the other things that you're going to do. Yeah. I've Uh, I've got some thoughts, but if you've got them, go ahead. You go first. Well, as far as like how this applies for me, like the health benefits, like getting in shape will immediately translate to better in like 
more enjoyable hiking trips. It's not going to be miserable when you get out there on the mountains and you're like, man, I'm not ready for this. It's like, so me being able to apply the training that I've put in for this type of event and then immediately go out to the outdoors, I mean, I can just slow down and, and watch things, you know, like you can enjoy the sights and kind of appreciate this, the one area rather than a whole mountain range at a time. So I don't know. I just feel like the physical benefits that you get for training for something like this will have an immediate, you know, correlation to a better experience on your next hiking trip. Yeah. For me, um, some of my favorite aspects of it is, are that you create a new relationship with miles. So Mm -hmm. any ultra runner, um, in my mind, you have a different relationship with what a mile means versus someone else. And so when you say 20 miles, it doesn't seem like, um, what it used to mean when I was, you know, a decade ago to me, or, you even say 10 miles and people think, oh, it's a whole day's worth of hiking. And now it's like, no, man, we can bust that out. Right. And so you, it, it changes your perspective on what's possible to do and places to get to. The other thing I would say is you push the limits physically constantly with ultra running and ultra just training for ultra runs. Um, so you learn a lot. So actually in the Colorado trail, Uh, we pushed way hard on day one. We did 21 plus miles, 6,000 feet of climbing with the fullest, heaviest packs we had of the whole trip, Mm -hmm. camera gear, et cetera. By the time we got to the top, I started cramping up, had a terrible night. You can go listen to that podcast, but I knew what to do now because I'd been there. I'd faced that. And so I, I hydrated through the night. I woke up in the night and I ate food. I drank more. I got up the next morning. I pounded water. I did, I did these things that I had learned through ultra running so that the rest of the trip didn't derail. And so by noon the next day, I was feeling better and I was fine the rest of the trip. So to me, it's like you learn things about your body that allow you to to f- know how to fuel, know how to, how to handle things, how to bounce back from things. And I think that comes in kind of the, maybe the little bit more prolonged ultra running or the more you train or the more ultras you do, I'm sure you just gain more and more wisdom. And, and so that's kind of my alert to sticking with this is to, is to just continue to learn like, why the heck am I cramping up this early? You know, like if I can figure those things out, then I know, and I can apply that, um, knowledge and, and turn it, you know, from knowledge into wisdom, hopefully for me in the backcountry. So to me, it, it's, it's just an awesome tool to, uh, teach you that what trails may be possible now and help you when you are dialing back the pace for backpacking, help you be able to, um, just keep your body and mind in a really good spot out there so that you can enjoy the backpacking you're doing better versus like hitting walls and stuff. Like I don't, I don't really hit calorie walls anymore backpacking. I don't really hit hydration issues backpacking anymore because of how much I've learned from ultra running and training for ultras. Cool. So I think the last, the last thing that I have is we've, we've had this, uh, discussion recently about acclimating for high elevation adventures. And, uh, you were able to spend, a couple of nights the previous weekend up on the Tusher Mountains and then went straight from there to Silverton, Colorado. We spent the night at high elevation. We did the whole 100 miles on the Colorado Trail, um, spent every night above 10,000 feet, I think. So then you came back and you had a week at 5,000 feet, which is where we live, and then you went right back up there for the race. So do you feel like there's any advantage to spending that extra week up high prior, or do you think it still took time to acclimate? I would say overall, um, I don't think it actually was a big advantage. Um, and I, I think that actually doing the hundred miles that close to the race may have just been too soon in, in hindsight, right? Like that wasn't really how I wanted to plan it. It's just the way that worked out with everyone's schedules. Um, my thought with this is twofold. Um, it didn't, I don't think it hurt me for acclimation, right? It didn't hurt me at all, but for acclimation specifically, but I think two nights at elevation was plenty to acclimate. I think the more important part for me going to elevation just still dials back to staying hydrated and lowering the stress on the body prior to going. I think when you're in the ultra, you can be just as susceptible to it if you get dehydrated, um, specifically. And so the year previous, I had to drive off the mountain in the middle of the night because I had elevation sickness. But to me, that was a hydration and exertion level issue. 
no amount of sleeping at altitude would have resolved that. Right. And this time, Eric drove off the mountain in the middle of the night because mm. he woke up with a racing heart, couldn't fall back asleep, headache, etc. cetera. Um, this year for me, I didn't. However, I could feel it building the next day. And so by halfway through the next day, I'm like, I do feel like we just need to get off the mountain. I'm not going to get my appetite back until we get to lower elevation, that kind of thing. So um, to me, like two nights at elevation would have adequately acclimated me. Um, and I think the more important part is getting great sleep, you know, not coming to elevation when you're like, like, don't do like a massive workout and then go to elevation. Like that's going to put you at risk. So great sleep, low stress on the body, and then just hydrating like crazy. So you think you probably weren't fully recovered from our hundred miler with only seven days in between? I don't think I was a hundred percent recovered. Yeah. I think it would have been way better for me to have done that two weeks out had a week of slow exercise to still move the body, stretch things out and taper into it and then do like a zero week. But it was a zero week, but I, but I still probably needed to do a little bit of movement to, to push things out of my muscles and stuff from the week prior. That's just my, my thought on it. Um, I don't think it was a huge impact on the race either way, but in a perfect world, I wish that it would have been a little farther out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we couldn't stop Darren from running the week prior, no matter what we did. So that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, I only did it a couple miles that week, so it wasn't that bad. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I don't really have anything to add to the altitude. I think Tayson summed that up pretty dang well. Uh, yeah. It's like for me, I had a little bit of altitude sickness going up to Del- Delano. But I think I would just work through that. And so that was it for me. So I, there's nothing I could have done to acclimate more other than stay up there longer. Cool. Yeah, I think for me, I, I just wonder if I just, as much as I love high elevation and it's like my happy place, yeah. I don't think I do great at altitude. Um, I think I it's very consistent that I lose my appetite, like very consistent. and And I don't know how to combat that because it's not something that, it's something that slowly builds in. It's not like I did this and then this happened. It's something that just slowly builds in the longer I'm up there. You know, by the end of the Colorado trail, I was slowly losing appetite each day and, and kind of the same in this race and and the day after. So, cool. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up. This has been a long one. Appreciate you guys sticking with us. Couple call outs real quick. If you're interested in scratch labs, that is under the member exclusive. So if you sign up for our live ultralight membership, uh, it's 10 bucks a month that goes instantly into a store credit account with us. So you don't lose the money. You just transfer it in there and then you can spend it on whatever you want, whether that's scratch labs or any other retail items that we sell, water filters, Tokes products. Um, or you can spend it on new launches. Or you can spend it on yeah. new launches like the Skyline Fast Pack coming out that we ran this race with or the CS40, which has been getting crazy good reviews. Um, very excited to launch that piece. I think the feedback on it's going to be amazing and has been amazing internally with everyone that's t- put their hands on it so far. So go join the Live Ultralight membership. It's a phenomenal way to buy food at the cheapest rates possible. It's the best way to save money on new launches because you get 10% off of any Outdoor Vitals product any time of year. You get upgraded shipping and a whole lot more. So go check that out. Again, it's just like a savings account. You're not actually spending money that goes nowhere. That money just goes into your savings account to spend later on our website. So um, other than that, make sure you guys are subscribed. We really would appreciate it if you shared this podcast around and it gives us the opportunity to grow and further our mission of helping more people get outdoors, um, and connect, disconnect more with this crazy world and reconnect with themselves. Ultras are a good way to do that as well as yep. backpacking in general. Um, but yeah, really, really appreciate it. Any last words from anyone? Darren, so. you're a freaking animal. I can't believe no. you did the 100K. You, you did it. Too, um, so. I I just can't <laughs> even wrap my – I could not wrap my head. Like that last segment, I was just thinking about you like as it's getting dark, and I'm just thinking, <laughs> where's Darren? How much does he have more to do? Like I can't even fathom it. So Glad it's done. You're, Glad you're it's done. One and, and done. And I, I'm sticking to it. So. <laughs> one and done. Um, we'll hopefully, see what he says in three months. Yeah. yeah hopefully, I can't remember the pain. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, this inspires you guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next one. Yeah.